Today I'm beginning a three-part teaching series that really kind of brings to light some of the early teachings of the historical church. The themes that I'm going to be talking about are death and resurrection, the cost of faith, and the necessity of love. These are, I believe, some of the most powerful messages shared by Jesus for those who have the ears to hear. Each of these themes holds significant roots in the Christian faith, and these themes, while being just as relevant today as they were when Jesus spoke these teachings, but being believers and followers in today's times, there's a kind of a mystery that kind of goes with them as well. And Well, that mystery kind of excites me a little bit, because it's always something to unlock and grow deeper in. Now, let me acknowledge that these powerful teachings have been studied, preached, published, and indoctrinated into the Christian teachings for a number of centuries. And because of this, it has become very easy for us to gloss over just how radical these teachings were when the hearers first heard them spoken by Jesus himself. In a way, this series might seem like a documentary about people who continue to live in primitive villages and in privileged, primitive styles where every hut and hope does not have electricity and running water. We who live in a modern place in a modern time will just sit there and go, how is that possible? How is that life? How is that living? It is my hope that these teachings that have been around for so long that we can realize something new and something sh- that we can share with each other and with the world. Today I'm going to be focusing on two texts, both of them found in John, both of them about resurrection. The first account gives us an account of what to look for and, and what took place immediately before he resurrected Lazarus. The second is about his resurrection, the resurrection of our Lord, when he appeared to the disciples in the house that they gathered. Let's look at our passages, shall we? John chapter 11, verses 33 to 34. 33 to 44, excuse me. When Jesus saw Mary weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in the spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep, so the Jews said, See how much he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus again was greatly disturbed. Came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. He was decaying. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I know that you have always heard me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. And then he said this as he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! You really didn't want to hear that through the microphone. And if you all think that he went, Lazarus, come on, no. It was a shout to wake the dead. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in the cloth. Jesus said to him, unbind him and let him go. The second passage in John is found in verse 20, and I'm only highlighting verse 19. When it was the evening on that day of the first week, and the doors of the house of the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. When we read these words of John, it is important for us to remember that these words are an eyewitness accounting of Jesus, written by a man in the first century. The concepts of death, resurrection, 
and an afterlife are different from our postmodern westernized ideas of individual survival. The nature of life or survival can be thought of in a variety of ways, but the fundamental question which surpasses two millennia of generations is, what happens to me when I die? Is there something or is there nothing? I think the book and movie that captured it really well and a question was, you know, when the gal who had the cancer met the boy that had the cancer and she said, what are you afraid of? He didn't say dying. It was what would come next, and his fear that there would be nothing. Those who believe in life after death are affirming in some manner to the idea that there is some essence of the individual self, the person we sense ourselves to be, survives the death of the body. It seems to be an extension of the French philosopher René Descartes' dictum, I think, therefore I am, cognito ergo sum. It is the individual of the I, the eagle, the self, that is in question. And it is assumed that the biological body itself returns to just or ashes. But the inner self, that lives on in some way. These questions come to us intuitively on the level of personal experience. Anytime someone we love dies, the heart stops, the respiration ceases, and the deceased is pronounced dead. In my time and working as a hospice chaplain and then as a, as a hospital chaplain, I watched this event happen over and over and over again. The person who was unique with personality and life now becomes a corpse. And it is easy to think now that this decaying body is merely a house or a vehicle for the inner self or the soul. It no longer is the person we knew in life. Respectfully, we would dispose of the body according to our cultural customs and personal choices. And no matter what we try, we cannot return that person to that body. This view of the human person as both mortal physical body and immortal soul or spirit is deeply rooted in our westernized religious philosophical past. For those that do not have any belief that there is life under death, there would be no need then for them to have any form of a spiritual faith. People who have faith, who believe what Jesus tells us, that there's a place waiting for us, understand there is something in the great beyond. Those that don't just believe in the finality of a nothingness. During the first century, when the Gospel of John was written, the commonly, view, the commonly held view of death, afterlife, and resurrection was incredibly bleak by the first century Jews. When a person of the Jewish faith died, they went to a place called Sheol, a dark underworld believed to be underneath the surface of the earth itself. There the soul of an individual resided. If God smiled favorably upon that person, in other words, blessed them, they would be given a lamp that they could use as they wandered around in the dark abyss. If God did not smile on you favorably, if you were not blessed, then you suffered by bumping into any and every obstacle that you would find, or would find you since you're in the dark and you can't see it. In the ancient world, when a person was resurrected, it had two different meanings depending on the context. One of them was the reconstitution of life to a dead physical body that was captured very well in Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 5 to 6, which says, Thus says the Lord to the bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I shall lay sinews upon you, and you will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. That which was dead, dried and decayed, would now live again in corporeal human form. But these were physical human bodies. They would wear out. Those people would die again. The second meaning of res resurrection well, would apply to the resurrection of the essence of the soul of the individual they would appear as what was commonly called a shade. This is a ghostly form of someone who is now dead, but they've taken some type of image that we can see them as. 
This from the resurrection this form of resurrection is found in 1 Samuel chapter 28 verses 8 through 15 where the infamous medium of Endor that word is not original to Star Wars it's actually out of the Old Testament the medium of Endor conjures up the shade slash ghost of the dead prophet Samuel because King Saul wants to talk to him. And when Samuel appears rising out of the earth in his ghostly form, he looks at Paul and says, why have you bothered bringing me up? When the encounter was over, when the conversation was done, Samuel faded back down into the earth to Sheol. In both applications of the word resurrection, deeply rooted in first century Jewish thought, death is a one-way street. It is the land of no return. But in the end days, the end times, according to Jewish teaching for their apocalyptic end, the dead would come forth from Sheol and live again in an embodied form. But what the experts in the Jewish law and the Jewish faith argued about, continuously about this topic, was what form would they take? That's the background of Jesus talking about being the resurrection and the life. Jesus comes along and starts teaching a new definition, a new understanding a new application of the term resurrection. And when he has questioned himself about resurrection, it is in Luke chapter 20 that he answers very clear with a very unambiguous answer. When the dead come forth, they will be like a transformed body, much like angels, not the literal physical bodies that they once inhabited. There will be no marriage or giving in marriage. There will be no male or female in terms of physical sexual gender. There will be no birth. There will be no death, but a new transformed life. <clears throat> I've paraphrased that passage. But these words, these teachings, this new way of understanding what afterlife resurrection meant with God was a threatening game changer to the teachings of death and resurrection of Jews in the first century Palestine. And when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he reconstituted the soul of Lazarus back into the body of Lazarus. The authoritative teachings of the Pharisees that they had been reporting for years and arguing over were now immediately threatened. The idea that death was the final ending, that it was something that you need to be afraid of so you live the right life now, had no hold. In other words, the edge that the Pharisees had over the Jewish religious community was obliterated. The Pharisees went to work immediately upon this resurrection to come up with stories and theories to discredit both the resurrection of Counts of Lazarus and even after Jesus himself when he was resurrected. John's Gospel goes to the point to give us an account of Jesus' ministry written to help us dispel the arguments that were being spread around. His was the last Gospel written. He's trying to say those arguments have no founding. I saw it happen. And John gives us such detail, names of the many witnesses that were there. He even goes so far to remind the readers of John, in John chapter 12, that there was a plot to kill Lazarus after Jesus resurrected him. This was an element of desperation that the Pharisees had, and they wanted to get rid of it and get back to business as usual as they had known it before. What the religious leaders were attempting to do was to stop the hemorrhage of Jews converting to the teachings of Jesus as a result of Lazarus' resurrection. There was no question that many people believed that God had done something singularly different than they had ever experienced in their spiritual lives on that day. 
They believed that because they had either witnessed the resurrection of Lazarus or Jesus, heard firsthand from those who were there, had personally experienced spiritual resurrection in their own life, or had heard the witness of others whose life had been resurrected from sin and despair by the saving love of Christ. Jesus became the key, the focal point, not the law. Not the 632 laws that they had to work to follow every day of their lives. You see, life with God, up until Jesus came along, had been very ritualized. You didn't think about it a whole lot. You just went through the motions. Remember that toaster oven that was sold a number of years ago by the Ron Popeil, Ronco Company? Put it in there, set it, and forget it. When the timer goes off, it's done. I don't, know if I, I don't know a serious cook who walks away from what they're doing. Lazy cooks do. They burn a lot. Or at least I did when I was younger and a lazy cook. It's very easy for Christian faith to become a set it and forget it motif. We go through the motions and rituals. We do not understand that it is a relationship. We do not understand that there is an element, an agent, a person who's wanting to connect us. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the grave, he showed God reaching down through the barriers that we like to have separate ourselves from him, especially for first century teachers, broke through it all and brought life where there was none. When God resurrected his son from the grave, he broke again through those barriers, the barriers of disbelief, despair, not knowing, uncertainty, giving up because our way wasn't granted. He reached through and broke through all of those by raising his son and saying, see, it is real. It is genuine. And it is for you. We can sing that first song, Amen, and say, I believe in the Son, I believe in the risen one. But how often does that become in the forefront of our minds of that this is what our Lord did by sending his Son? I believe we still, in some way, live with a fear of death and live with a fear of the unknown sometimes. I'll be very honest, my wife and I have faced that with her own health. We've kept this under wraps, but she had to go back to the cath lab this past week because there's a blockage in one of her arteries that feeds her heart. And this is the darkest and lowest I've ever seen my wife in all of this journey. And she looked at me and she said, I don't want to die. She was afraid. And as a selfish, self-centered husband and father... I said, I don't want you to either. I'd like to have a nice long life with you. Here's the question that shames and humbles us. In our fear, where was our hope? Where was God? And you know what the personal irony for all of that is? What am I teaching about this morning? Resurrection. It's very hard for me to say this knowing that I struggle with it just like everybody else. I'm not an authority. I'm just someone who's thought about it. But here's the beauty of resurrection. The resurrection that Jesus talks about. It is not something that we need to fear. God has a plan. And you see, and that plan is for everyone who is beautifully and diversely created in his image to come and spend not only this time on earth with him, glorifying his name, to spend all of eternity glorifying his name. I have no idea what I'm going to look like when I get there, but I hope I look better than a person who has a face for radio. But if I am truly in the presence of the divine, resurrected into his glory, into his place, who cares? Because if everything that God has made is richly and wonderfully made, 
then I will finally be the fullness of that creation when I am resurrected from my grave and stand with my Lord and my Savior. But in my humanness, <clears throat> in the weak moments of my faith, I get seduced by the wonders and the powers of medical science. Death is a truth revelation of our mortality. It is the one unstoppable force that no human endeavor can totally overcome. But we can slow that process. We have medications that allow us to live longer. And it's interesting, but in the last 40 years, the life expectancy has grown by almost 40 years. And it's not because of treatments and drugs and medications. It's because of vaccinations, healthy birthing processes, and better nutrition to our people. I spent a number of weeks researching this. That's what I found. But no matter what we do, whether you're a health nut or a junk food junkie, whether you're taking a cocktail of 25 meds or just merely vitamins, we cannot stop the ending of our lives. It was the early followers of Jesus, the disciples, that felt the same powerless that I am bringing to the surface of your hearts and your minds. If some of you are feeling like your heart is in your throat, that's where I'm wanting you to be. That feeling of fear, that feeling of desperation, that feeling of unknown. That's what the disciples felt when Jesus was crucified. And that's what they were feeling when they were locked themselves away in that upper room because they were afraid that they were going to be captured and have the same fate as Jesus. They had given three years of their lives to follow him from one edge of the, of the empire to the other. But allowing themselves to die the same way? No, they weren't sure about that. And then what happens? Jesus appears. In their hopelessness, in their defeat, in their fear, in their anxiety, in their being lost, in their not certain of the future, of being afraid to have a coherent thought, Jesus stands and brings hope in a moment of hopelessness, saying, you want to know the following of the three years that you did with me? It has not been in vain. The plan continues beyond this world. And that's what Jesus being the resurrection and the life gives to us. That there was a plan. And that there was something greater and better waiting for us when we are done with all this crude, corporeal, whatever this is. I don't have a word for it. Can't even make up a good one. But we so quickly forget it. We get worried about projects. We get worried about quotas. We get worried about meeting budgets. We get worried about having ministries continue. We get worried about stuff that we get so easily derailed from understanding how much our God loves us how much he has saved us from ourselves and from the fear of the unknown tomorrow where our death resides. When I was little, and I mean little, and I would have my moments where I would think about heaven, and because I couldn't picture it in my mind, I couldn't relate it to anything that I knew in this world, I would be terrified. And my prayer wouldn't be in that moment, God assuage my fear, because I didn't know the word assuage at that time. It was, God, give me an idea of when I'm going to croak, so I'll be ready and prepared for it. Here I am, 40 some odd years later, I've never gotten an answer to that one. 
and I don't need one. I'm not afraid of being resurrected into paradise. Today, what scares me is what I'm going to go through to get there. That's another teaching series. That's another Bible study. That's another discussion. Death for believers and followers of Jesus is yesterday's news. No longer have to have the fear that some ghost of an ancestor is going to pop up out of the ground and go, Hi, how you doing? No longer do we have to be afraid that if there is a reconstitution of soul into body, that instead of looking as wonderful as this, I look like a boulder or a tree or a stump or... I really don't want to be a carp. (laughs) Because in the places of darkness, in the places of hopelessness, in the places where you're just not sure, that's when our Savior shows up. Giving us hope in the hopelessness, light in the darkness, direction when we are lost. And coming out of that darkness, coming out of that dross, that is genuine resurrection. Because we're coming out of where we shouldn't be, a place that can ensnare us and trap us and never have a moment of happiness again. We have our Messiah who is there saying, let me show you the way. No, no, better yet. I know how to get there. Come with me. That allows us to not be afraid. That allows us to say death is yesterday's news. That allows us to be able to go forward with a boldness of our faith that we may not have had before. It gives us the freedom for when God says, I need you to go here. We say, yes, Lord, send me. Would you all pray with me, please? Loving God, allow us to live with the freedom, without the fear, of knowing that your Son brings us life, both here and now and in paradise. We no longer have to be unfocused on the fears of what lies ahead, but instead, O God, we can live as people where resurrection of faith is a real, visible revelation signaling that life can be beautiful and wonderful because you give to all of us who believe and follow in your son's name. Allow us to go forth, to proclaim, to think, and to celebrate the gift of resurrection that has come with and through your son. We celebrate this all in his precious name. Amen. Talking about resurrection and the afterlife in a lot of churches I've worked with becomes one of those topics that well. But if it wasn't for the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we would have no reason to gather. We would have no reason to serve. We would have nothing to look forward to. And that peace of resurrection is something that we don't always talk about very often. We like the idea, but we don't think about it. We don't let it be a hope within our lives. And that's what it really is. A hope that we do not have to fear for tomorrow because God has already taken care of it. As you go from this place, take what you've heard. Think about it, pray about it, wrestle with it. And if the Spirit's calling you, apply some of it to your lives. But as you all go from this place, go without fear. Go knowing that you are children of God. Go in grace.
be filled with this peace. Have a great week, everybody.